Hatchets, hoes, knives, iron kettles, moose skins, matchlock muskets, yards of cotton, and pounds of English coin. There are several incidents where Massasoit's clearly disgruntled with the way things are changing. For instance, he agrees to sell some of his land to some of the settlers down in Rhode Island, and um, they pay him for it, and he says, this is, this is nowhere near enough, uh, and he gives it back. And they refuse to take it. They refuse to take um, the gifts, the, the payment back, and they say, you know, you can't return this, and this is a done deal. This, this land is now ours. The English were in a race to establish empire in the Americas, jockeying for territory with the French, the Spanish, the Swedish, the Dutch. They're very expansive and they don't expand incrementally. They're aware that the Connecticut River is a major conduit of trade. The Dutch are already on the lower end of the river, and so clearly they want to control the Connecticut River from its midsection. With the influx of English people in the 1630s, Puritan New England ceases to be weak and vulnerable and now becomes a power in the region. As they look for the west, they see another major power. The English identify the Pequot as an obstacle to their expansion. In the spring of 1637, Massasoit received word that a force led by Massachusetts Bay and Plymouth colonies had destroyed the Pequot the most powerful Indian confederacy in the area. In the final battle, English soldiers, to the horror of their Indian allies, had burned an undefended village, killing hundreds. The Pequot War established in Indian minds the potential savagery of the English. The idea of 700 people, men, women, and children, perishing in the burning of a fort was incomprehensible to Indians. It was a cautionary tale that Massasoit did not forget. What gun is Nanapi? An animal won't. Soon after the destruction of the Pequot, Massasoit traveled to Massachusetts Bay Colony to deliver to its governor, John Winthrop, a gift of 16 beaver skins and to restate his long-standing friendship with the colonists, all in hopes that they would continue to honor the promise of shared security the English had made in that first long-ago treaty. Massasoit hopes that this tribute is going to solidify his friendship with Massachusetts because he's worried, um, and he's not the only one. Winthrop writes in his journal that after the Pequot War, Dozens of Indian groups in the area come to Massachusetts to the court and try to make friends. Say, you know, we, we want to be your, your friends, your partners, your subjects, whatever it takes. They're, they're frightened. Massasoit's eventual heir, his second son, was born around the time of the Pequot War and nearly 20 years after the arrival of the Pilgrims. He knew no world but the one in which English and Wampanoag lived together. Even his names would suggest a man comfortable in two cultures. He was first called Medicom and later Philip. He came of age in the 1650s in a world his forefathers could not have imagined. He fancied fine English lace work and richly detailed wampum. He was one of the few Wampanoag who kept pigs. And he counted among his close friends both Indians and Englishmen. He was described by an English traveler as walking through the streets of Boston, decked out in massive amounts of wampum, uh, showing his uh, wealth and his power, comfortable walking in this world that had been created together by the English and uh, the native people of the region. As he approached manhood, 
Philip was more and more aware of his father's growing unease. Massasoit's tribal borders had receded in around Narragansett Bay. Disease continued to thin the Wampanoag. His trusted ally, Edward Winslow, had died. The new leadership in Plymouth had little memory of the time they had needed Massasoit's help. When do the English lose their sense of openness? Well, when they become more independent, when they realize that they no longer need the Indians. And right around that same time, in the 1650s, they make one attempt to convert the Indians to Christianity, which is to say, in effect, well, if you're gonna live among us, you need to basically become us because we can't live with people who are different from ourselves. In 1651, Puritan minister John Eliot established a praying town in Natick, Massachusetts. In Natick, as in the dozen praying towns that followed, Indians who converted to Christianity were assured physical security and the promise of eternal life, so long as they agreed to live by moral codes drawn up by Puritan clergy. The praying Indian towns were set up by the English to uh, basically control Indians. You had all these rules that were alien in concept, and Native people had to do everything in the English way, and everything Indian, of course, all the traditions that were sacred to your fathers and your father's fathers since time immemorial, you had to reject all that in favor of following the English way. So you had to look down on your own people, essentially, is what it boiled down to. Wampanoag people here got the idea that um, somehow, um, if we are to survive at all, we've got to at least say that we're assimilated. We've got to say that we're Christian, whatever that means, or we're gonna be wiped out completely. In order to be accepted as a full member of the church, you needed to relate a conversion experience that was witnessed by the congregation and that was deemed sufficient that you've been saved, that you believe yourself to be saved. We have this remarkable set of documents that were published at the time called Tears of Repentance that were Indians from Natick relating their conversion experiences. And they were witnessed by a panel of ministers. I heard that word, that it is a shame for a man to wear long hair, and that there was no such custom in the churches. At first I thought I loved not long hair, but I did, and found it very hard to cut it off. And then I prayed to God to pardon that sin also. When they said the devil was my God, I was angry because I was proud. I loved to pray to many gods. Then going to your house, I more desired to hear of God. Then I was angry with myself and loathed myself and thought, God will not forgive my sins. I see God is still angry with me for all my sins, and he has afflicted me by the death of three of my children. And I fear God is still angry, because great are my sins, and I fear lest my children be not gone to heaven. The English missionaries demanded from Indian people much more than an expressed belief in their God. It was part of an English cultural assault, which Massasoit must have seen was tearing apart many native communities. And I think that's why he wants to try and curb the missionaries, try and stop this kind of assault taking place. As Massasoit's days drew down, he made a point of stipulating in land deeds that Christian missionaries stay out of what remained of Wampanoag territory. Having watched the English erode his tribe's land holdings and his father's authority, Philip determined to make a marriage of power. He wed a woman who was a leader in her own right, the daughter of a chief who had opposed Massasoit's alliance with the English from the beginning. Massasoit must have wondered what kind of world he was handing on to his sons, to his children. 
I think there's a certain resignation in some of his actions toward the end of his life. An attempt to stem the tide of, of English assault on Indian land, on Indian culture, on Indian sovereignty. And a lingering hope that maybe things will still work out okay. Maybe there can still be peace. Because I think that was his vision of what New England would be. It was a vision of peace. Massasoit died in the early 1660s, 40 years after his first alliance with the Pilgrims. His passing came just as a new hard-edged generation of English leaders was rising to power. Men like Josiah Winslow, Edward's son, who was intent on hastening the final reckoning between the Wampanoag and the English. Philip, just 24 years old, took his father's place as the Wampanoag chief. And suddenly, it's all on him. He was leading in a very difficult and very dangerous time where essentially every part of our society was being stripped away. The wampum trade was declining, fur trade was declining, the demand for the English to acquire more and more Algonquian land was increasing. More and more native people, for whatever reason, were choosing to move to praying towns. The world that had created Philip uh, was collapsing around him. Philip hoped to strike a delicate balance, maintaining his alliances among the English while also maintaining what remained of Wampanoag sovereignty. He continued to abide by the terms of his father's treaty. But like his father, he rejected repeated efforts by Puritan missionaries to convert him. If I became a praying sachem, I shall be a poor and weak one, he said, and easily trod upon by others. He also declared a moratorium on land sales. English authorities had little interest in humoring the young Wampanoag chief. There were a variety of ways that English claimed possession of Indian lands. Everything from just seizing them and then attending to the legalities much later, merely occupying lands that they want to declare vacant and thus available for the taking. One that is, I think, often overlooked is that the English would get Indians indebted as Indians continue to experience ill health and epidemic disease, one of the things they become indebted for is health care that's being provided by English guardians. Well, these English guardians use this as a way to get their, their hands on Indian land so that once the debts have been accumulated, they go to the Indian estate for the land for payment. And this becomes a massive mechanism of Indian dispossession. What people felt for millennia, this is my land, and my land is me, and I am it, obviously, because we come from it, and we eat from it, and, you know, things die, they go into the land, and we eat from what grows from there. So when we say land, ahki, just, it's just ahki, land. But if you say my land, you have to say natahkim. This means that I am physically the land and the land is physically me. And after Europeans were here for about 70 years, people started, you started to write Natahki, which is so sad, because that means I am not necessarily part of the land anymore. It can, my land can be separated from my person. <laughs> 